Hello, my name is Zach Gibbs, and I'm a content developer within education services inside Juniper Networks. And today we will be discussing the address book objects with JWeb Learning Byte. All right, so here's the example. We're going to have a network here. We have the VSRX1 device in the middle. That's the device we're going to be configuring. Then we have the DMZ server. That is a part of the DMZ zone. Make note of that IP address because we'll want to use that IP address as we reference it in an address book entry. And then we have the users zone, which has user one. Again, that IP address for the user one is important. So make note of that as well. And then we have the internet zone and the internet server is a part of the internet zone. And we will be using that IP address for the internet server as a part of our address book objects. All right, so let's look at the criteria for the example. We need to configure VSRX1 using JWeb with the following criteria. We need to create some zone based address book objects for user one, the subnet for user one, that is, and the DMZ server. And then we need to create a global based address book object for the internet server. And then we want to build some security policies. We want user one to access or be able to access the DMZ server. And we want user one and the DMZ server to be able to access the internet. And then we want the internet server to be able to access the DMZ server. And then we don't want user one to be able to access the internet server. That internet server only needs to be able to communicate with the DMZ server. And the DMZ server only needs to communicate with the internet server. We don't want user one being able to communicate with the internet server. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and jump to the JWeb interface for VSRX1. All right, so here is the JWeb interface for VSRX1. And we are under the configure workspace and we need to go to the security workspace and then objects and then zone addresses. We need to create an address object for user one and an address object for the DMZ server. So we'll click the create button and then we'll create a zone address. Uh, we'll need to specify the zone first. We'll say users. I will call this address uh, just users. So it's gonna be the user subnet. We're gonna specify the subnet here and that's gonna be 10.1.1.0 slash 24. Now, if I were to specify an IP address here and not include a subnet mask, that means that it'll be a slash 32. So just keep that in mind. And we can configure some address sets and that would allow you to group address, multiple addresses together, but we're not going to worry about that for this example, that's unnecessary. And then we'll create another address object, say zone DMZ, and then we'll say a name DMZ server and we'll specify the IP address. And we're not specifying a subnet mask, so that means this is going to be a slash 32 address. Click OK. So now we need to create a global address for the internet server. So we go to the global addresses workspace, and then we can select the global address book. And we can create a new address book here, but it's unnecessary. So once that's selected, we can hit the edit button, and we can click the create button for the addresses tab and then we can give this a name we'll call this internet server and then specify the IP address click OK and then we'll click OK again and then we need to commit the configuration or at least let's try and commit the configuration see what happens and we get an error and I knew this was gonna happen because normally you wouldn't commit the configuration right now. We still have to create some policies, so normally we would wait to create those policies, but I wanted to show you the configuration error that we receive by configuring zone addresses and global addresses at the same time. Notice how the error message says, zone specific address books are not allowed when there are global address books defined. So that's a problem, we can't have that, but we can work around this issue. We'll get rid of that notification, and we'll go back to zone addresses, and we'll go ahead and delete these first. Okay, so we've deleted those. And what we can do here is we can go back to the global addresses workspace and we can expand the global address book name. However, we don't want to really put those zone based addresses here because then they'll be able to use elsewhere in different zones. And we don't want that for the example we're working on. So we want to create a new global address book. We'll call this internal 
internals, there we go, and we'll select, we'll attach the zone users and DMZ. So we did that, so that's gonna be attached to those zones, so it'll only be allowed to reference in regards to those zones with these address entries that we're going to create. Click the Create button for addresses, the addresses tab that is, and we'll add in the DMZ server, specify an IP address or the IP address for the DMZ server. Then we'll add in the users, specify the subnet, click OK. And then we can click OK again. And this will work. I'll go ahead and commit to show that it works. You can see it committed successfully. That's great. And now we can create our firewall policy rules. Now keep in mind the commit was not necessary. I just did the commit to show that it was going to work. We could create these address objects and then without committing, create the firewall policy rules. So just keep that in mind. So let's go to the firewall policy workspace, then click on rules. So we'll click the create button to create a new rule. And keep in mind here that as we're creating these rules, we want to create the most specific rules first. And that's going to be the rule that blocks the traffic from the user subnet to the internet server. If we were to create the other rules first, we would probably have to move rules around afterwards. So to save some time, let's create that first rule that blocks the user traffic from accessing the internet server. So we'll specify a name, we'll say users to internet server, specify a source of user zone, so that's fine. Then we'll select an address. Now we select the include specific address selection option. And in here, we'll see the DMZ server, users, internet server. We'll see basically all the addresses we configured. And that's because we configured the DMZ server and user addresses to be attached to the users and DMZ zone. So that makes sense, those are there. And then the internet server is a global address book entry without any zone attachments. So that's gonna show up there as well. So we wanna select users, move this over, click okay. Go to the destination section, select internet. Now we'll see a difference here. Click the select button, select include specific, and DMZ server and users address objects are not there, just the internet server, and that's what we expect. We'll click next, advanced security, leave that at deny, so we're just specifying an action of deny and not specifying any other advanced parameters. Click next, click finish, and click OK. All right, so let's create another rule. We'll say under this rule, we'll create the rule that allows user one to access the DMZ server. So we'll just call this user to DMZ. Select the source, it's gonna be users again. Source address again is gonna be users. Select okay. And then for the uh, destination, we can select DMZ zone. We can select include specific again. We'll select DMZ server, click okay. Click next and we'll want to select permit to allow the traffic. Specify no other parameters, click next, click finish. Click okay. And then we have that rule created. Now we want to create a rule that allows the internet server to access the DMZ server. So we'll click the create button. We'll give it a name. Click next. We'll specify the zone of internet. We'll click select for the addresses. Include specific and only the internet server address object is available. Now the any IPv4 and any IPv6 is also available, but I'm referring to the custom objects that we created. Click OK. Then under destination, we want to select DMZ. And then addresses, we want to select the DMZ server. And then we want to permit this traffic. Now keep in mind, if you were doing this in a production scenario, you would lock this down much more than just allowing all traffic from certain addresses, depending on the current setup in your environment. So keep that in mind. Click Next. Click Finish. Then click OK. Now we have one last rule to create. We'll call this rule INET access, and this will allow the users to access, as well as the DMZ server and the user to access the internet. You know, sans the user being able to access the internet server that we don't want that user to access. And this is gonna be easiest if we create a global policy, because we're gonna to have to create two rules if we don't. Select the global policy option, then let's go to source, and then of course we can't select any zones because this is a global policy. Then we'll select the addresses, include specific, and notice here that we only have the internet server. Now that kind of is a problem here. We don't want that. We don't want to have to create two rules. So let's go ahead and cancel this. 
without making any changes there. And let's jump back to objects and then global addresses. And then we can go to the global address book, edit that and add in some global address objects for the DMZ server and the user. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll call this DMZ global. We'll add in the same address or the address for the DMZ server. Click OK. And we'll add in the users, we'll call this users global. Subnet of the users. Click OK. And we'll click OK again. And then we'll jump back to firewall policy rules and create that rule again. So we'll call this INET access. Select the global policy option. Select source. And now we'll be able to select those specific source addresses because it's going to be in the global address book. Now these are completely different address objects than the ones that we used or we created in the zone attached global address book that we called internals. So under destination, we want to leave that open. Now at this point, you might wonder what's going to happen because we created that zone based rule that said user one can't access the internet server. Is this rule going to override it? Because we're saying from the user subnet and the DMZ subnet, you can access anything on the internet. And the, the, the good thing to know here is it doesn't. Zone-based policies take precedence over global-based policies. So we'll be OK there. So we'll click Next. And then we'll select Permit. Click Next. Finish. Click OK. And then let's go ahead and commit the configuration. Okay, that configuration is committed, so let's go ahead and jump to the different devices and test things out. All right, so here is the user one device, and so let's go ahead and attempt to ping something on the internet, other than the internet server, of course. And great, we can do that. So let's go ahead and ping the internet server. Can't reach it, perfect, that's what we want to see. And so then let's go ahead and attempt to ping the DMZ server. Great, we can access the DMZ server. Things are working as expected. So let's go ahead and jump to the DMZ server and have a look there and see what the DMZ server can do. All right, so here is the DMZ server. Let's attempt to ping the internet server. All right, things look good there, great. Then let's attempt to ping just something on the internet. Perfect, that's what we want to see. So lastly, the internet server should be able to access the DMZ server. And we're gonna use wget and that's the address it's going to use because we're gonna have destination NAT enabled on VSRX1. And yes, we are able to use wget to access the DMZ server from the internet server. So that brings us to the end of this learning bite. We discussed address book objects and we demonstrated how to configure address book objects using JWeb. So as always, thanks for watching. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks certification program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.